not getting, it's not giving me a chance to go there. Do it one more time, see if it works. And Are you guys, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me or we are out? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, good. I'm gonna try one more time. Not sharing. sharing. Go to Excel. And keep it. Yeah. Open. Stop this. Uh, not giving me a chance to go. Uh, I'll do it some other time. I'll uh, try one more time. Open. Oh gosh, it's not helping. I'm gonna cancel. I'll do this some other time, maybe. Not working. I don't have, I guess, things like that. Cancel. Okay. Um, have to do it. Me. Um, all right. Okay, high quality. Not sharing. Um, all right, folks. I'm sorry I couldn't get there. There were some other things that I have to uh, upload. It. Can you hear me now? Are we back? Yes. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't get there. There are some other software that I don't have it now, or they updated. It's going to take some time to do it, and I didn't want to take more time on doing. I tried to do it quickly, but it didn't work. Uh, I will put the functions. Um, I went through this one. I will put the functions on um, on 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 um, Canvas, and I might just uh, have like a quick um, quick uh, you know uh, video. We'll see. Okay. Last time we were on chapter 17, and um, I mean, we are going through chapter 17. This is the last page of chapter 17. Let's go through this. And uh, we have here, it says, uh, a 2014 study sought to compare cognitive capacities among trained musicians and those without formal musical training. Among the conclusions for the adult, adult group is stated, Independent tests, one tail, that means one sided P, we're looking at it, reveal that adults with musical training perform significantly higher than non musical on standardized measure of verbal fluency 
that's what P, the P value for verbal fluency, and design fluency, that's the P value for design fluency, backward digit scan, that's P value for that. I don't know any of these, but the problem, but anyhow, and a trend towards significant for coding, that means P is, for that is, the P value is that, no difference in performance were found for color work interference. That's p-value and trail making. That's another p-value. Those are the some of the jargon that they use it for musician, trained musician, and non-trained musician. And we are going to compare. We are going to look at those values whenever they mention the question. All I have to go and look at the p-value based on p-value. I can draw some conclusion uh, between music trained musicians and, and um, uh, uh, non-trained musicians, basically. So what does the fact that the test was one tail simply about the researcher's assumption regarding the effect of musical training? So it's a one tail, that means you're looking at the P. For musical training, basically what it means uh, they assume that um, if uh, if there is any difference uh, uh, observed, so it would be due to you know uh, uh, better cognitive cognitive ability. That's the way uh, you uh, look at it. It's when you look at it between musician and non-musician. Here it says, what does they because you're looking at one tail p and it's it, it, uh, look at the cognitive ability of the trained musician versus non-trained musician. So maybe I can rewrite this one as cognitive ability of trained musician musicians. Um, is better than non 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 trained non musical non musical non trained musical people what does it imply about Background digit span. So we look at background uh, digit span is where is background digit span? Uh, here is this. It is this one. So therefore, p value for that is 0 0.001. Very small, or you can conclude that this is 1.0.1%. That it had the lowest p value among the functions tested. If you look at it, this is then lower than any other p value. This is the lowest one. So, again, if this is the lowest one between musician, you're comparing between mus trained musician and non trained musician. So, basically, again, it goes back better cognitive ability that the musicians, the trained musicians, have. Uh, trained. Musicians had a better cognitive ability. What do you suppose the authors meant by coding showing a trend towards significance? Here, let's look at this. Coding showing towards here. This is this is the trend towards significance for coding. Its p value is 0 0.098, or you can say 9.8 percent. This 9.8 percent is beyond the usual thing that we look at it as 5 percent. So therefore. Uh, this 98% is greater than 
uh, usually 5%. This is the usual threshold we look at it. And in this case, if this is the case, we say not statistically significant. Remember, this is like a similar to alpha, and you always count, this is the p-value, this is the p-value. If the p-value is greater than 5%, that means, that means you cannot reject the null hypothesis, or you're gonna fail to reject the null hypothesis, then you say not significantly significant for the alternative testing. And the last one, what implies that color world in, uh, inference and trail making show no difference in performance? Again, if you look at it, P for color world, what is it? That is, P is 1.160. So this one for trail mix making is P is equal to. 0.423. So in this case, this is like a 16%. In this case, this is 42%, 0.3%. Right? So basically, what we are saying, although we can see um, differences here between these two when we do the sample, but when you look at it, the 16% is greater than 5%. 42.3% greater than 5%. So therefore, in both cases, when you're looking at like that, we say not significantly population. So that means you fail, fail to reject the null hypothesis. So that means if you fail to reject it, that means no differences in performance. Which is no differences in performance that you can see that. Although when you look at it, when you do it, when you take the samples for this and that, there's a difference, a large difference. This is 16% and that's 42.3%. But when you look at it in terms of the population, because you look at this one and you draw the conclusion about the population, in both cases, both are greater than 5%. Both, when you look at it, so you say not statistically significant among the population, and therefore we can say we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That means if you fail to reject it, that means you accept that there is no difference in performance. And that's what it is. All right? Okay, we are in chapter 18. Chapter 18 is we are talking about um, uh, it, so far um, we have uh, seen two methods of um, doing statistical inference. One is confidence interval and the other one is tests of significance. In both cases, we use basically what we use, we use population mean, right? And also we use population sigma for our, for our calculation. And here we are, the, the definition, now we are gonna use the definition here. It says, the following must be true in order to use Z procedure for chapter 16, that is confidence interval, and 17, so that would be 
basically tests of significance. This group 17 would be tests of significance. Okay. So this is 16 confidence intervals test of significance, both of them are here. We use for that. So basically uh, for test of, uh, for confidence interval, we used, um, what was it? If you recall that confidence interval, we said it is, we take X bar plus and minus Z star sigma over square root of N. And the Z itself, Z for C, we're looking at the Z, the Z value was what, well, when we calculated, it was X bar minus mu zero divided by sigma over square root of N. And in this case, we assume that H zero is mu equal to mu zero, and alternative would be either not equal to not e either one of this, not all of them. Mu is not equal to mu zero, or mu greater than mu zero, or mu is less than mu zero. Either you can't have three at the same time, one of them. So this was the summary of what we learned in, in terms of formulas in uh, chapter 16 and 17 for confidence interval and tests of significance. So for these two, we have to observe, we assume that these are happening. These are the cases. So if you want to do both of these, uh, um, that means observation must be normally distributed. That means when you look at the histogram, roughly symmetric and no outliers, and basically clustered around the uh, center, the mean, whatever the mean is. Also, uh, S, the sigma is known. Because if you look at all the uh, problems we have done so far, sigma is given to us. You're going to see that in the future, and like next week or the week after, we are going to do different kind of distribution that sigma is not known. And the last part is the sample is SRS. So basically, these three observations, these three uh, uh, conditions that we have, they should meet in order to do the confidence interval and test of significance. And then we had margin of errors. Margin of errors here, the margin of error for confidence interval only accounts for the error that occurs from uh, accidentally getting an unrepresentative sample to a valid sample sampling process. That means something, you're doing everything right. Yeah, and something happens. Either when you're entering the data, you might enter the wrong data, or um, uh, when you're transferring data, when you're plotting data, something that unknowingly happens by accidentally happens. It's not something that, oh, you forgot to do it. No, it's not. So that those are the errors that we, when we calculate with regards to the confidence interval. We are not looking at errors that, like for instance, these are these are errors that, uh, like difficulties such as under coverage or non-response. This margin of errors have nothing to do with these errors. Those are our errors that we, we have it in our um, design. If we design better, we won't have, we eliminate those errors. But errors that happen in margin of errors, it's something that it's out of our control and it happened accidentally. Okay, that's called margin of error. And if you recall that, when we wrote CI, confidence interval, we had X bar here minus Z star, sigma over square root of n. This is the lower bound, lower end of the confidence interval, and this is the upper end of confidence interval. So this is the margin of error in the upper part, margin of error in the lower part. So margin of error is equal to z star sigma over square root of n. Z star, you calculate that, or in um, you're going to see in Excel, 
you, I showed it to you how to do it. And um, uh, you use the Z star, uh, like a 95% confidence interval. And uh, I'm gonna do it one more time to make sure that in case I didn't get a chance to do it, say 95% um, Let's go with different numbers. 90% confidence interval. So we want to find Z star for this one. If you look at the table, the table, well, we have 90%. Look at the 90%. Although this is 90% on here, confidence go all the way down here. It's one point. If you look at the Z star, you can see 1.645. 1.646. So this would be 1.646. So if you want to use Excel, in Excel, what you're going to do, you're going to subtract this. As I said, this was like that. This is the curve we have here. This is the 90% of the curve. is the 90% of the curve. And this is that Z star you have here. This is minus that Z star you have there. You can either calculate this Z star to due to this curve, this area, or you can calculate this Z star due to the larger area. Either way, it would give you the right answer. So if we want to go for the larger area, so that means if I say 1 minus 0.9, that's going to be 0.1. Now I'm going to take that point 0.1, divide it by 2, that would be point 0.05. So each of these areas is going to be point 0.05 or 5%. This is going to be 5%. Now I have this value. So if I want to use this area, bigger area, so that would be, I have to count, I'm calculating Z star, and the Z star would be equal to, so, uh, this is the area, right? That would be 95% in this case, right? So that would be absolute uh, value, not absolute here now. You say norm dot s dot in, and then you put this 95, 95%, that would be 0.95. If you do that, you get a number which is close, very close to to what we have here. Let me see if I have it here. 90% do I have? Yeah. I have here 1.648536. And when you compare with this, you can see how close to that this value is. This is, you use it in Excel. Okay. So again, this is going to be Z star. You don't write like this. You put equal sign there, norm.s.m and you put this value. And you calculate this value just normally. You say one on the cell, equal sign, you say one minus 0.9, and then it's gonna spit out this, and you can even divide it by two, and this will give you 0.05. And you take that cell, put it in this equation, or add it to 95, put it in this equation. Or, now we are gonna use this one. If I wanna use that one, that would be this area. That would be this area. That's the, to, to the left of this, but that's gonna give you negative Z star. In order to get around that negative Z star, so you have to say absolute value of norm dot S dot in, and now you're gonna put this value here, 0.05 because that's going to represent the smaller area. And that would give you, if you don't put absolute value, you're going to get negative Z star, which is okay. Then you can put absolute value later, but you can do it one, uh, you know, all of them at the same time. That would give you 1.648536. That's how you find Z star in, in, in uh, Excel. Are we okay with this or do you want to see another example? Yes, someone says yes or no. Hello? Okay, you want to see another one? Okay. 
Uh, okay, let's do another one. Uh, okay, let's do another one. Let's do 70%. Say, um, let me just write it like this. Confidence interval is 70%. So from the C table, you have C table here. Again, we're looking at the table C. And table C, 70% is here. Do you see that? At 70%? At 70%. So you're going to look down all the way to, to, to uh, Z star. And that is 1.036. So that's going to give you Z equal to 1.036. That's from the table. But you can't put that value from the table in Excel. You gotta use Excel and do it. And again, this is nothing but this is this is basically it's this curve. You have this normal curve and you have 70% of the area is here. 15% would be here, another 15% would be here. This is what you have the table. You're using the table for that. This is table C. Gives you easily that area. It's been calculated before and uh, tabulated. So you can see that easily. And the reason for that, this stands for Z star, and this is minus Z star. Okay? So between those two values, you get the 70%, and that belongs to 1.036. Now we are going to use Excel. In Excel, in Excel, again, we're going to do the same thing. And this is, again, 70%. But I have 15% here, another 15% here. Because if you subtract 100, my 100% minus 70%, that's going to be 30%. 30% because these two areas are equal, so each will take 15%. Okay? So we have 15%. Now we are, and notice that this is minus Z star. This is plus C star. In Excel, when we calculate this, uh, when we calculate this in Excel, so let's calculate, we are going to calculate Z or Z star. For Z star plus C star. So I'm going to go to the cell. In the cell, this is a big cell. I'm going to put equal sign there. And the previous cell, I can write the previous cell like this. Z e star equal to. That's going to just a, just a text. You're entering text there. And the next cell, I'm going to put equal sign. And if I'm calculating this. So if I want to calculate this Z star to the left of this, the curve, the area is the entire this area. So that means 70% plus 50%, that would be 85%. Right? This entire area is 85%. Entire area. So I'm going to write this one here. So it's going to be norm dot s dot uh, m, and then I'm going to put that 80% here. That 80, 85%. That would be 0.85. And if I do that, if I enter enter this, then I'm going to get the answer is going to be. It's going to replace this one with this answer, and that answer is going to be 1.03643338 or whatever the number. You can see how close this number is to this one. Right? This is Excel number. You get it, and that is you have it from the table C. You can also get this from table A, but there is other uh, way of doing this. Here, instead of just 
calculating from this side, I can do all these additions. All I need to do is just forget this area. Again, if I want to do that, let's use another, if I want to use minus Z star, so this would be, again, I'm going to say Z star equal to, so this is going to be the other cell again. In this case, you're going to put apps because this is negative Z star, I'm putting apps around it, make it positive. That's the reason I'm gonna put apps. If I don't put apps here, it's gonna show negative number. But I wanna have my Z star to be positive. Because you put the positive value of Z star in the confidence interval, so you need to have positive. So you have apps, and the rest is gonna be norm.s.inv, and instead of putting 0.85, because now the area is only 0.15. If you just press enter, and then you're going to see this is going to be the same as this table, 1.36433, some other numbers. Okay? I think by now you should know how to do it. I mean, really. Just type S star, Z star equal to, let's put this number there. You know the logic behind it, why you want to put 0.85. You know why the logic behind this is, you want to, why you want to put apps here and 0.15 here. So you know all these things. So by now you should be able to do this. Okay, are we okay with this? Hopefully, yes. All right, let's see. We always back to here. Yeah, back to here. Let's look at this one now. Two polling frames, Gallup and Rasmussen. Two polling frame, uh, uh, firms, not frames, firms. We have those two independently arrived at 95% confidence intervals for the pro for the popularity of members of the U.S. House of Representatives. The two intervals are different enough that they don't even overlap. If third-party observers observers agree that both surveys were conducted responsibly. To what can we attribute the difference in result? We went, we, I show you, I showed you a curve. Let me just go, I'll show you one more time this curve. When you look at the curve here, suppose this is 95%. So that means if you do the testing, this is Z star here, Z here, this is minus Z star. Suppose you're doing testing here. One testing is going to show you, that's going to be the confidence interval. Mu is going to be here. Another one you might do it, mu is going to be here. Another one you might do it, mu is going to be here. And But if you do 100 of them, probably five of them are going to be outside. Let's see, put one out. Mu is going to be outside this one, okay? Five of this, if you do hundred of them, okay? This is, say, we're doing this polling was for, what was it, Gallup. This is a Gallup side. Is it Gallup? Rasmussen will do the same thing. So I'm going to do Rasmussen with uh, uh, me. So they have similar thing here. They can do the polling here. This could be here. This could be here. Even overlap. And there could be something here. And it could be something, you know, different. The one here too. If they have five, it's gonna be outside this range. So if they, again, they do, um, um, this is going to be outside. Rasmussen. Rasmussen. 
So you can see this is out. If you do hundred, if they, this uh, Rasmussen did hundred uh, samples and found you know, they found that ninety five of them are going to be within the range of ninety five percent. Only five of them are going to be outside. The same thing goes with Gallatin. Now the problem is comparing one of each. It says if you read here, it says the two intervals are different. So I can pick two intervals are different, right? So I can pick, let's just pick two intervals. They're different. Let me just read this. Two intervals are different enough that they do not overlap. And if a third party observed that, they see that um, what attributes this difference. It's obviously you can see I can plot, I can plot uh, two of these. They are two different. Here, this is one, and that's another. They don't overlap. The interval it goes from here to here. That goes from here to there. Or we can let me just make it really obvious. This is this side. And that's gonna be you can see they do not overlap. And this is mu false here between this is an interval for Gallifold, this is an interval for Rasmus, and both of them are within the 95%, but they have different intervals. Both of them are correct because this is 95% of the. But if they do 100 samples, 95 of them are going to fall within this range. The same thing goes with that. There is a possibility one of them, which is going to be outside of the interval, just the other one at the same time they are doing theirs might be within the interval. So that's possible and quite all wrong. Okay. So, um, let's do this. I'm going to write this here. That was detailed uh, uh, explanation, but I'm going to plot it here. This is what we have here. And suppose this is, this is 95%. We have the area is 95%. And suppose I'm doing this for, for the Gallup. The possibility one is going to be here. This is what we call it for the for at the same time there might be one. At the same time you can see that they do not overlap. There might be one here. This is what I'm gonna call it. <coughs> You can see that both are correct. Because in this case, this is one of the 5%. One of 5%. But 95% minus 1, 5% of them is going to be outside the range. And this one is only one of the 95%. Uh, of the samples. That means out of the 95 samples, this is one of them that happens to be here. And this is out of five samples, which is going to be outside the range, one of them happens to be, and at the same time they don't overlap. This is quite full. Right. This is okay. Okay. So basically <clears throat> this can happen. Move up. Okay. All right. Are we okay with this? Yes. Did I uh, explain this that you guys didn't see what I said? It's the same as what I had the um, curve in the previous page. You can see visually, you can see they do not overlap. One is outside the range and the other one is not. And both of them quite all right because the one is outside the range, it's among the 5% because 95, we know that when you say 95% confidence interval, that means if you take 90, 100 samples, 95 or more are gonna be within the range, five or more are not gonna be within the range. At the same time, in this case, this is one of those 95 of them that's within the range, so it's possible. Okay, Addition, additional guidelines for tests of significance, hypothesis testing. 
test. It says how significant is significant enough? Well, it says uh, basically when we look at it, we say how re reasonable is H0? What are the consequence of, consequences of rejecting H0? In order to answer to that, you've got to look at the p-value. And the p-value should be smaller than the threshold that you're dealing with, whatever it is. So I said that usually we assume that 5% is good. If it's less than 5%, p-value is small, then you say uh, statistically significant, then you can say, okay, we can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. So again, depends on the testing and what H0 on it. But in general, let's write it in general, if this is less than alpha, and so, and assume that, let's just give an example, my p-value is equal to 0 0.005, alpha value is given to us is 0 0.01, so you can see p-value is smaller than that, so that means 0 0.005 smaller than 0 0.01. So this is, now we say, statistically significant. So that means, because of this, we can reject null hypothesis, H0. If this is the other way around, then this is not significant, statistically significant, then you fail to reject H0. So that is what we say how significant it is. If you raise alpha to, or if you make alpha even smaller, very, very small, then your the answer could change. So it depends on what um, uh, what is reasonable that you're doing this calculation. So we said that, I said that either I will give you alpha in the exam, or if I don't give you alpha in exam, you assume that if it's less than 5%, that means it is statistically significant, you reject the null hypothesis. That's the assumption. But, uh, but I will give you, you know, um, the level, the alpha, the uh, significance level. And then you can always compare to that. If it is smaller than that, you say, and reject the null hypothesis, and statistically significant, therefore reject the null hypothesis. And if it's greater than alpha, given alpha, then you say, well, it is not statistically significant, and therefore you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. This is another thing that this part of the uh, notes that we are going through. Statistical significance does not mean practical significance. Small that p value does not necessarily mean a large difference between mu and x bar. It's true. If you get a small value, it's a when we say statistically significant, that means we, we are going to say that either we reject or not reject. That's it. But we are not going to comment on this how large is. The whole thing is, you know, from the mean, like when you're looking at mu versus x bar. Here, you calculated x bar, and you are going that you're using the 95% here, so your mu can change back and forth. Go, might be here, might be there, depends. So when you do the testing, it's a, a it's a similar thing that you're looking at it, and you say the statistical significance. It it doesn't mean that you're going to see large differences between mu and x bar. Just says that there is, that means uh, it goes back to, uh, to the null hypothesis. You reject the null hypothesis, you accept the thing. Okay, performing the same experiment multiple times until you get the desired result, it's not good. Do not do that because that is just you can do you can do two times and the second time you might get the right answer you say oh I'm gonna stay with this you might do a thousand times and a thousand one time you get the right answer 
and either way you're getting the right answer, so or the answer that you like to get it, that's not statistical. So it's not good to 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 wait for the right result. You have to set aside number of tests or how large your sample is based on that, based on the design of experiment. You decide about those numbers and you do testing. Regardless what the outcome is. When you take the outcome, you do the analysis on the outcome. The test of significance provides probability for obtaining samples like the one we did. Yes, we learned that test of significance, uh, we are calculating the p-value. This represents the p-value, test of significance. Again, in order to get the p-value, what do you need to know? You got to get the z-value or you got to get the z-value to see what the uh, calculus of p. While a confidence interval provides more details about the magnitude of difference between sample mean and hypothesis. And you can see that here you have mean is changing, the mu is changing, how far is from the sample mean, it's going back and forth. The sample, you're doing the sample, you can see the mean is changing. So it's just within that interval. So every sample you do, the value is going to be different. Right? Okay, let's do this. And um, here what we have, the study of Alzheimer's patients reveals that at 10% significant level, see, it says significance level, that's your alpha. Your alpha here defined to be 10%. Therapeutic non-drug non-surgical treatment can reverse some of the cognitive decline caused by the disease. Should we accept the results as significant evidence to introduce treatment or not? Okay, the same person. Would it change your answer if the treatment was instead a course of drugs with several potential side effects which would decrease the patient's quality of life. Okay, let's see. At 10% level, significance, you know, significance level, the therapeutic uh, option may not actually work. But the consequ consequences of rejecting H0, that means that Therapeutic, rejecting it here, therapeutic treatment does not work. Or so basically, at ten percent level, this the uh, option that uh, it's given to us. At 10%, that therapeutic, non-drug, non-surgical treatment I can reverse, uh, you know, some of the symptoms of the disease, uh, cognitive decline. So we want to look at that, and we can see that at 10% level, the therapeutic option may not actually work. But based on the consequences of rejecting H0, if we reject that, that means the therapeutic, the therapeutic treatment does not work. Rejecting H0. Are small. Okay. Wouldn't rejecting the null hypothesis indicate that there is a significant difference 
the groups mean that it will take therapeutic treatment does work. Uh, yes, rejecting all hypotheses is true, but what we have here at 10% level, significance, right? So this is may not here, um, may not actually, okay. Here what we have, <clears throat> If you look at this 10%, we don't have the p-value, right? To look at the p-value. If we take this 10% as something that we are looking at it, like a p-value, maybe I shouldn't have put here alpha, and the 10%, you look at it, 10% is large when you look at it at 10% level. So at that level, when it's large, that means you are what are you doing? You're basically failing to reject the null hypothesis, right? So the rejecting the alternative hypothesis is going to be small. Does it make sense? If you're rejecting, consequently that rejecting H0 is all small, if this is small, so that means failing to reject the null hypothesis is going to be large. Failing to reject the null hypothesis to become large, that means they are equal. Yeah, does it make sense? You gotta look at it from here. Rejecting are small. So that means it's a small amount that we are gonna accept that the significant differences between treating and not treating. So it, that in turn tells us that the null hypothesis, we fail to reject, that means null hypothesis is it, it's working. Yes? Because the rejecting the null hypothesis is small, very small. Just assume that it's zero. If it's zero, what would you say? If they if they're rejecting the null hypothesis, I mean, rejecting the null hypothesis, you don't have small number to reject the null hypothesis. That means it's big. Say it's 50%, not 10%. If it's 50%, so that means definitely it's not working. I'm just confused because you wrote rejecting the null is basically saying that the therapeutic treatment does not work by what you wrote in the okay, let's look at did I do something wrong here? At 10% level, the therapeutic option may not actually work. So if it doesn't work, that means if it doesn't work, that means you're 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 failing to reject the null hypothesis, right? Because if it works, then you reject it. But if it doesn't work, you're not accepting. It. Okay. But the consequences of rejecting H0, if that is small, rejecting that, that means reject you can't reject it. So therefore, that therapeutic does work. We are saying that, okay, this should be like that. Is that right? Let's see, at 10% level, the therapeutic option may not actually work. Consequences of rejecting H0, you reject H0, uh, that means a therapeutic uh, treatment You reject it, that means therapeutic treatment is not working. This was correct. The rejection is small, that means it's not working, right? I think the consequence, but the consequences of rejecting H0 are small. Okay, good. Maybe I should take this one out, look at the small. So when you look at the small, so you say it doesn't work. So it's the same. That means it's the same. The treatment doesn't work. It's the same, which is the null hypothesis. All right. Let's look at this one. The survey asks both, both active military and non-military individuals whether or not they approved of the Iraq war. Inference determined the difference in proportion of approvals between the two groups 
was statistically significant if P is less than 0.01. Can we say that a much higher percentage of military individuals approved of the war than non-military? So basically what we have, we have here H0, and let's call this um, 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 mu, and mu is approved, approval, right? And let's say alternative would be not approved. Alternative, no, let's say this is, I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna say mu military, uh, mil military is mu non-military. And this means the difference between these two is zero for approval. Okay, so this is, they are, both of them are saying that they approve the, the whole thing. The difference would be zero. So non-approval, non-equal, if they, are not, they don't agree on the approval, so military is not the same as non-military. So when we say P is less than 0 0.01, it's way, way less than 0 0.05. So that means you have to reject the null hypothesis. That means this approval, you have to reject this one, get both approval with the, the same. You have to say, if you reject that one, you have to accept this one. And if you accept this, so you're going to say there is a difference between military and non-military in terms of acceptance or approval. But you cannot say military has higher percentage approval than non-military. All I can say, there is a difference. This is, we are saying that are they the same in terms of their approval? This is, says, no, they are not the same. P, the P value we calculated, it's way, way smaller than 0.05. So therefore, it says that we have to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. Alternative hypothesis, all it says, they are different. It doesn't say which one is, has higher percentage approval versus the other. It says they're different. So basically, we say not Necessarily, all we can say is that we are sure that there is a difference. That means military and non military. There's a difference. You can't say which one is has a higher percentage. Okay. Let's go to the next uh, example. Don't have questions, I will go to the next one. Next one is in the 1990s and again in 2015, Reebok produced a shoe that had an air pump built into the shoe. The implicit claim from advertisement was that pumping up one's shoe would increase the height of vertical jump. Okay. The hypothesis is tested in a control experimental setting. Describe the difference in the following two hypothetical experiment results. One is a single experiment results in a p-value of 1%. Basically, this is 1%, 0 0.01. The other one is of 100 separate tests, one test gives a result significant at 1% level. 
Okay. So H zero would be what? Mu is equal to mu zero, no difference. H sub A alternative would be mu is not equal to mu zero. There's the difference. So for the case of A, the experiment is basically it's evidence that um, um, of the difference between jumps because you're doing single experiment, the p-value is very small, right? So therefore, this experiment, the experiment is evidence, convincing evidence, evidence of a difference between jumps type of debuff and um, P value is very small for them. In the case of B, there are really no difference because one out of 100, you saw that up there, it's going to be the significant difference. 99 times there wasn't a difference, difference between them. So this is, there are really no difference in jump time. Okay, I hope you see the difference between these two. This is you did 100 times, and only one time you saw that there was a difference. 99 times you didn't see it, okay? And this is, you did one experiment and the p-value was 1%. So definitely this is gonna tell you that there is a difference. This is, uh, there is no difference, okay? Let's do page four. Page four is against H zero, mu is equal to 100. The study tests the claim that individuals enrolled in public universities have an above average IQ. The study finds a p value of 0 0.031 and a 95% confidence interval of this. So we have P value. P value is 0 0.031. Okay. And also confidence interval is we have the lower bound is 1.8.108.4, and the upper bound is 112.8. Also, we have mu is equal to 100. Your, this is your mu zero. Your mu zero is equal to 100. Average. Okay. What should we agree? that the confidence interval does not contain mu zero. You can see that, right? You can see easily when you do the confidence interval, <coughs> interval, you're expecting that the mu to fall between these two numbers. Your mu zero is 100. 100 is outside these two numbers, right? This is one of those, like when you say 95%, you do the experiment, one of those experiments you do, mu is going to be outside that 900 when you count. Hmm. So, we count with p value. If we assume that alpha is 5%, let's assume that threshold we put for this one is alpha is 5%, or we usually look at 5%. So, you can see the p value 
here is 0 0.031, it's less than 0 0.05, and therefore we reject null hypothesis. So you can see that it's not true here because when you reject a new, because you know that the mu zero is not here in the confidence interval here, and based on this, you reject the null hypothesis too, which is in this case, your mu is equal to mm -hmm. zero is equal to 100. Okay, what information does the confidence interval provide that is not included with the p value? Good question. So let's see what p-value gives us and what the, uh, the uh, basically um, confidence interval gives us. P-value always gives us some kind of assurance that there is a difference. Another way that if the p-value is very small, it's not going to be the same as what we have in the null hypothesis. It's going to be different. Different than mu zero equals 100, mu is equal to 100, uh, 100 equal to mu zero. But CI or confidence interval tells us if this is within the 95% of the time that if we do this uh, measurements and calculate the mean of the IQ of the public university students, we see that it's gonna happen between these two numbers, mean. 95% of the time, the mean is going to happen in those two numbers. So, if I want to write this, I will write it p value gives us uh, some kind of assurance that there is a difference. That means mu is not equal to mu zero, not equal to one. On the other hand, confidence interval uh, tells us that 95% of the time, the time uh, that we are sure that the mean, mean uh, IQ, the average of IQ of the public universities, public universities is uh, universities of student, students. We're looking at their IQ lies between or is between 108.4 and 150. That's going to be that's the p value versus versus uh, CI or Okay. I didn't bring my phone to me. What time is it? Oh, it's 1 19. Oh, okay, folks. I guess I can't go, further, but we have one and a half days to finish. So your midterm is going to be through chapter 18. So we'll finish this on Monday. And probably. I will not include this error part in the exam because I didn't cover it today. So it will go through chapter 18 up to type one error and type two error. We'll talk about this uh, next time. Would you mind going back to example four real quick? Sure. Example four. Did I put my example four here? Example four. Okay. Example four. Example for real quick. Example four. 
you have questions or you want to look at it? Good to see you. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, folks. So I hope you uh, you will do your um, Excel. I'm hoping that I can fix the Excel for Monday on Monday. And if you want it by then, if you still have questions, I can do that. But you shouldn't be having any problems. Yeah, I went through so many examples. It's just follow exactly what I said on Excel, and you get the right result. All right. Thank you, and have a good afternoon and good weekend.